If you have your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Be our text. Second Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Tonight I'd like to preach a message on the subject of the preaching of God's Word. The preaching of God's Word. Now, notice in our text we find that Paul wrote to Timothy under the inspiration of the Spirit and he told him that he needed to preach the Word. And I submit to you today that from the start we notice that the man of God needs to preach the Word. Nothing else will do. The preacher is not to get up and preach any other word except for God's Word. It is a shame and it is a sin to preach anything else. And preaching itself is a, a characteristic belonging solely to Christianity. No other, no other religion has made the religious instruction and exhortation an integral part of divine worship. And, and that's exactly what it is. This is the main part of the service. It's not the singing, although the singing is important. Uh, it's not the fellowshipping, although the fellowshipping is important. Uh, it's not uh, anything else, uh, but the, the main portion of the worship service is the preaching. Now, if you go through the scriptures, you'll find that Judaism did come close uh, in this, but not like the way that we know and understand it. First thing we want to look at, then, as we consider this subject of the preaching of God's Word, we want to consider the call to preach. The call to preach. In the, in the book of Acts, chapter 13... Acts chapter 13, and beginning of verse 1, and going down to verse 2. So Acts 13, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. God has his man that he calls into special service. And yes, it is a man. It always is a man that the Lord calls to preach. Now I know that in the world that we live in, there are women who will get up and they will say, the Lord has called me to preach, but that's not the Lord. Uh, and you say, well, how do you know that? Well, I know that because the Lord does not lead anybody contrary to the Scriptures. 
and the scriptures are very, very clear. It is always a man. If, and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the occasional preaching of God's Word, like some do, but what I'm talking about here is the dedication of a man's entire life to this spiritual work. It's good that there are men who will gladly stand in the pulpit and help out and those sorts of things. And we need that. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. That's a good thing. But beloved, if God has called a man to preach, I believe He's going to call him into some service somewhere. Uh, whether it's a missionary or to pastor a church, but God is going to call him into some full-time service. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, oh, before we get there, though, let's look at, let's look at Acts chapter 13 for just a moment. Uh, so we find there the, the pattern here that... The Holy Ghost uh, called these men out. Uh, Barnabas and Saul for a specific work. And, uh, and, and then it says in verse 3, And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. From thence they sailed to Cyprus. So we find that the Holy Ghost worked in these men, calling them out, and he also worked in and through the church. And certainly, uh, the Lord, uh, we find that the Lord's church is that is that instrument, that 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 place, that way that God works in the sending forth of missionaries, uh, pastors, preachers, and so on. Uh, you will not find any kind of a pattern for freelance preachers or uh, un unaffiliated preachers or anything like that. They always, the pattern is that they are called of God and the Lord, the Lord sends them out in and through the Lord's church. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. <coughs> it says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. One of the one of the pieces of advice that my grandfather gave me when I told him that I'd been called to preach was get out of it if you can. Uh, don't enter the ministry if you can help it. But if you have been called into the service of God, uh, there is no higher calling. Charles Spurgeon put it this way. He said, if God has called you to be His servant, why stoop to be the king? Brother Mink, who used to pastor this church, he wrote something in 1994 that recently started circulating across Facebook. And uh, I'm going to read it here. Uh, it's not very long. He said, The Lord's preachers are human, believe it or not just as much as any of us. They come from all areas and levels of society, but mostly from homes poor in material wealth. They come in all sizes, tall, short, fat, skinny, and in between, but they are all of the male sex. Most people do not care whether they exist or not, that is, until they get in trouble. Then they ask, where is that preacher? What's his name? Then the first question they ask the preacher is, 
Why in the world did God let this happen to me? But in fact, God's preachers are not hard to find, for they are constantly being told by a great many people, you get in my hair, preacher, or you get under my skin, and that is about as close as you can get to any person. The Lord's preachers are required to have the wisdom of Solomon, the disposition of a lamb, the swiftness of an eagle, but when he makes a mistake, he's called an ignoramus. If he unapologetically preaches the truth of God's word, he is accused of being hard-hearted or inconsiderate. And if he is not promptly at the scene of every church-related emergency, some of the members will say he is lazy. In the eyes of a great many people, the Lord's preacher is a bogeyman who spends most of his time talking about the place down there. While the great majority of secular employees get paid vacations, holidays, and a host of other job benefits, and rightly so, the Lord's preacher is on call 24 hours a day, every day of the year, and his job benefits, other than the meager salary, are few or none. He has no pastor, nor labor union, to take his grievance to. Each church member knows or should know that God's preacher has but one mission in life, and that is to reprove sin, first in himself, and then to whomsoever it is seen. He is considered a dedicated man, but he should keep quiet about the little sins, immodest dress, or colored jesting, and oh yes, why does he criticize other churches? If God's preacher drives a big car, he is materially minded. If he drives a little car, he is not concerned in bringing people to church. He is expected to be the first and the last person at the church building, no matter what kind of car he drives. He must be at all times ready to meet the public and represent the church. If his old faithful suit begins to show wear from the many drops of pulpit sweat, he is undignified. Yet some members keep telling him, Don't you forget, we are giving you your living. No matter how sour the grapes, he must ever be an extrovert, which is sometimes most difficult. But faith in God has made an unceasing optimist of him, and he knows the rain which comes into his life falls from the cloud of God's merciful and ben beneficent providence which abides upon him. Soldiers get medals for bravery. Industry gives promotions and certificates of merit for jobs well done. Lodges bestow accolades upon their worthies. The entertainment world has their outstanding artists upon whom they award with trophies, but none can compare with the reward that the Lord's preacher will receive when he faces his God and hears him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. The Lord's preacher knows that in order to become the President of the United States, he would have to take a big demotion. The Lord's preacher may in old age retire from the pastorate, but he will never cease to preach, for there is no discharge from that high and lofty calling. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. No matter the heartaches con connected with a God-given ministry, there is no better or more soul-edifying work. And I think what Brother Mink wrote there is really encompassing what a lot of preachers feel about being the pastor uh, or being a missionary or, or serving the Lord. Um, I remember one of the other pieces of advice that I got was, uh, David, you get into this sort of thing, remember, the benefits and salary ain't much, but they are out of this world. And uh, certainly, certainly that's a fact. Brother Mink brought up 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. So let's go over there. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. It is a good work, this work of pastoring. But it is a work. Uh, 
It is a work. And I think a lot of, a lot of folks forget that. None know the extent of it except perhaps the one who's been called into it. And yet, those who are called into it don't give it up unless they've not really been called. And I believe there are some who gave it up who never really called. Now there are times when a person may give it up because of health. But I know that otherwise they wouldn't have. I think of my grandfather. Uh, he uh, he, 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 I remember when he was younger, and I'm talking about younger, I'm talking about when he was in his 70s. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I thought he was pretty close to Methuselah's age when he was telling me these things, but, um, but he told me, he said, David, there's no retirement age. And, uh, and, 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 and he said, you know, I'll, I'll quit when, when the Lord calls me home. I believe he believed that. But the Lord had other plans for him. And, uh, his health wasn't able to keep up and, 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 and all those things. And he did, he did have to resign. I, I, I know of other, other pastors who have had to do that. But I can tell you what. His mind may not be what it used to be. and He may forget a lot of different details of things. But... It's a great testimony of God's grace and, and His love for the Lord that whenever you're, uh, whenever He's able to be around the preaching of God's Word, my grandfather's still able to add things and help out and, 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 and know enough to uh, add something to the service. And he's never forgotten them old hymns. There's something about it. There's something about it. It is a work, but it's a good work. It's a good work. The best work that there is, but only if you've been called into it. But let me tell you, if you've been if you haven't been called into it and you try to get into it, it ain't a good work. And I've known men who were never called into it. And they tried to they tried to make it work and it didn't. It didn't. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. One thing about it is the preacher's got to preach. The man of God who has been called to preach has got to preach. And he loves preaching. I love to preach. And I know a lot of men who love to preach, but our love for preaching is not the huge crowds that we draw. It's not, it's not the great amount of compliments that we get. And we don't get... When you start preaching the truth, you don't get much of either of those. Well, we love to preach because it's God's Word. We love to preach because we love God's people. And we love not only God's people, but we love people in general. You want something to keep you humble. <clears throat> One of the books that I was given early on said... If you're getting a lot of compliments about your sermons, keep this in your mind. It might be that the people are just obeying that verse that says, bless them that persecute you. And, uh, and I mean, you keep that in your mind, yeah, really. But at the end of the day, we're not looking for compliments. I mean, we enjoy those sorts of things. Preachers do, because let me let you all in a little secret. Preachers sometimes get discouraged. 
Preachers sometimes get lonely. No sorts of things. Preachers are human. And it's, it's good to encourage the preacher. But we don't preach fishing. I don't say all preachers, but I'm saying the Lord's preachers don't preach looking for amens or compliments or a pat on the back. Uh, we're preaching to please the Lord. We're preaching to give God's word and to present God's word truthfully. There are many different styles of preaching. In fact, in fact, much ado has been made lately in some circles among Baptists about the style of preaching. And there's many different ways that you can divide, divide it up. Uh, and those who have been to school, depending on where you went to school at, uh, where you took your homiletics class at, you might divide it one way or another. But the most common are topical, meaning taking a topic from the text without ever going back to the text. Uh, textual, meaning the subject is drawn from the text and then everything else is built around that text, including the outline. Or expository. Expository preaching is when the sermon is developed by expounding or enlarging on a subject from a chapter, a verse, or a book. One of the more common expository methods of preaching is verse by verse going through a book of the Bible, but that's not the only kind of expository preaching that there is. Uh, in fact, the expository method is the most instructive method. The expounding uh, of the of, of, of the of the text, uh, this, uh, this method is, uh, I would say, the most instructive of them. And most pastors, even though they might have a favorite method, at some point or another, usually hit on this if they're preaching the Bible. Uh, and uh, those who have a favorite method rarely stick to the same method all the time. There is a divide, though, that's happening among some of the brethren. Just to illustrate the, the division, uh, on Facebook, uh, one fellow recently, and I, and I, and I, love, I love both these guys very much, but one, one guy said, Verse by verse preaching is of necessity not only too shallow, it is also of necessity too scattered to be motivational. And another guy, another guy preached and he was saying, I'll repent of preaching this topical method message afterward, and we'll go back to it expositional next week. The reality is. The reality is, if you go back to our text, there in uh, there there when Paul wrote to Timothy, Second Timothy chapter four. What what was commanded of him? If we go back there, Second Timothy chapter four. And uh, and then uh, verse one it says. Well, verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The command is to preach the word. Don't get bent out of shape too much on the style that's used. As long as the word of God is being preached, rejoice in it. Uh, some men might like one style or another. Uh, and and I, I believe that you all find that I mix it up. Uh, I do some topical, some expositional, and uh, and every week, uh, those who those who come here on Sunday and Wednesday both will find uh, something of each type, each style. Uh, and uh, if you want to try to keep score, now you know the definitions of the different kinds. <laughs> 
you can come back and let me know. But, uh, but you know, not only are we told to, to preach the word, but then in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, it says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Then 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. So, not only are we to preach the word, but we're also to be apt to teach. Uh, and, 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 and I mean, uh, you know, some, some folks try to divide up teaching and preaching. And um, uh, I mean, even if you go into Ephesians chapter 4, where we read just a moment ago, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and uh, verse 11, It says this, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So they'll try to divide up preaching and teaching. And they'll say, well, teaching is for Sunday school. And preaching is for a certain hour of the service or certain services. The reality of it is, if you go through the New Testament, you will not find... A a specific service for teaching. You will not find a Sunday school service. You will not find any r sort of division like what we we tend to do in our time. I believe this preaching and teaching comes together a lot of times in the pulpit, and it should. Uh, and, it, and it should. I believe that the preacher, the pastor, the missionary needs to be apt to teach. He needs to be a preacher and he needs to be apt to teach. And so when it comes down to preaching styles, the attitude that we ought to have, I believe, is that, that so long as God's word is presented in truth, we ought to rejoice in it. And I get too bent out of shape about whether it was in this column or that column or this other column. Was it preached in truth? In fact, Paul ran into this issue. If you go to Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, and uh, begin at verse 12, Going on down to verse 18, he says this, But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice." Notice what he said. He said, and, 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 and Paul, as he's writing, he says, hey, there's some people who are encouraged because of my bonds, because of these bad things that are happening to me, or these seemingly bad things that are happening to me. Some are preaching Christ of envy and strife. Those dirty rats, don't listen to them. They're the, they're the bad guys. No, that's not what he says. He says... Some are preaching Christ of envy and strife and some of goodwill. Some are preaching Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, 
the other of love, knowing that I'm set for the defense of the gospel. So these two camps. But he said, you know what? In every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and I will rejoice. Whatever they intended for this to happen out of it, I'm just glad because Christ is being preached. And so, why should we in this day get bent out of shape over somebody's style as long as the truth is being preached? And so what is it that's needed for sound preaching? Well, we've already mentioned two things. First of all, the man of God. And you need the Word of God. But there are some other elements that's needed. Because, you know, God, God doesn't just uh, hit a man over the head, hand him a Bible and say, go preach, and that's it. There's some other things that need to happen. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Good sound preaching, in order for it to happen, requires study, and it requires much study. I mean, what you all get uh, from the preaching of God's word, whether it's me that's standing in the pulpit or... Or, and I can speak for anybody else that stood in this pulpit. I can guarantee what y'all get is just the tip of the iceberg. The hours that get spent in study and preparation. For a 30 minute sermon, that's hours of, hours of study. And it... it and I mean, if if we were if we were to take this and 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 really uh, apply it to our age, I mean, he's saying, "Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness." Turn off the TV and get into the Word. Profane and vain babblings. Right? Forget about the man cave. Forget about the 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 the, the, the entertainment, the what spend some time in study. The preacher has to do that. If he doesn't, it'll catch up with him. And he says, A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Paul was a tent maker. I believe that he was a tent ma maker on purpose. I believe there's a reason for it. Sure, he financed his missionary journeys a lot by this tent making, but I, I believe that this was one of the one of the ways that he got in amongst the people real quickly. Uh, tents was a, a thing that people needed, and he was a tent maker. This got him into the marketplace amongst the people, uh, and and uh, and. Uh, you know, uh, there were times in my ministry that I used to th used to think, "Oh, I feel sorry for myself," and "Oh, I wish I was uh, full time, full time in the ministry." And then, then, then the Lord opened this up to me, and I realized, you know what? God has given me opportunity to be amongst the people in a way that. I wouldn't be able to be if I wasn't working out in the world. But you know, also with Paul, as he wrote this, he says here, rightly dividing the word of truth. As Paul was a tent maker, I believe he knew some things about measurement. 
one wrong measurement and that tent would be messed up. As he cut the material, the leather and skins and whatever he used for tents, he had to measure it to cut it right in order that everything would fit together properly. If it didn't, he would have been a tent maker that was very much ashamed. Uh, you know, if you're in any kind, any kind of business, you make anything, uh, there's good customer service, there's good quality product, and there's bad, regardless of when you're doing it. And, and Paul understood that. So it is with the handling of the Word of God. We have to handle it, to, to divide it, to put it all together in a way that is pleasing to the people. No, I'm just kidding. Not to the people. <laughs> just making sure y'all are awake. We've got to put it together in a way that is pleasing to Almighty God. Because at the end of the day, it's not the people that we we will stand and in, in who will who we will stand before in judgment. It's not the people who call us. It is God. We are servants of Almighty God. And I'm afraid. I'm afraid. As as I as, as I consider this that there is a tendency for some men to fear men more than God. Let us remember this. Let us consider these things. Let us be students of God's Word. We can't cut corners here in our studies. My wife, my kids know these things. There are many a late night or early morning and any pastor will tell you these things when where's daddy? He's in his study. He's in his study. Forget about the office. Forget about the man cave. Forget about those things. He needs to be studying. Give him space to do that. And I mean this church doesn't have this sort of problem but I know some churches where they they have so many different parties and so many events that the pastors run ragged trying to keep up with everybody. Going here, there, and everywhere. A, a good pastor knows when to say no. And he needs to say, no, I need to study. And, and rather than getting mad about it, the church ought to rejoice and say, you know what, the pastor couldn't come here at this birthday party or this event or whatever because he's studying and they ought to rejoice and praise God for it and pray for him as he prepares for the week for the message uh, as he studies and prays over the service Acts chapter 6 <clears throat> Acts chapter 6 and verse number 4. Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. I'm not going to go back and read the whole thing, but y'all know what happened. The widows felt like they were being neglected. And the twelve called called the multitude together, the, the disciples together, and they said, it's not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. And so they called out some men. We call them deacons. The Bible calls them deacons. For the purpose of doing some physical things so that, so that these men, the apostles, could spend time in, in, in study and prayer. <coughs> 
And oh, how we need prayer. We need to be in prayer. The, the, the preacher needs to be a man of prayer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We need... In order to have sound preaching, we need the Holy Spirit. Used to be, folks would pray a lot for that the, the, the pastor would have unction from on high, that the, that the, the Holy Spirit would overshadow him, and, and, and those sorts of things. We need that, because let me tell you, a man might have studied a lot, and he might have some great things to say, but... It, but if, if he doesn't have the Holy Spirit, that message will flop. That message will flop. We need to be led of the Spirit. We need the Spirit with us when we preach. And as I kind of bring this to a close, we talk about the preaching of God's Word. I can't not go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 20, it says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. A lot in here. There is great value in preaching. There is great value in being called of God. Why? It doesn't make sense according to the world, does it? It doesn't even make good nonsense according to the world. But the reason of the value is because, not because of who the preacher is. It's not because of how great of a speaker he is. But it's great because it's God's plan. From the pulpit to the pew, from the church house on over to the house where you live, the White House and everywhere else. 
everyone ought to treat this with great respect. Now we know that not everybody will and does. But the fact is that that, doth, that doesn't change the preaching of God's Word. We have a message to tell. And we preach God's Word. We preach Christ crucified. We preach what's foolishness to the world. But unto everyone, both Jews as well as Greeks, the so-called enlightened ones as well as the 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 barbarians everybody in between it's the power of God and the wisdom of God may God help us to have great respect for the preaching of his word may we be faithful to his calling as well as to hear what God would have us to hear. May he add the blessing. Brother Ray, would you please pray?